Hello, welcome to a very special edition of Marvel Standom. I'm Den of Geek News and Features Editor Kirsten Howard, and I've got a brilliant guest this week, Jay Holtham, a terrific writer who has not only worked on the Jessica Jones, Cloak and Dagger and Supergirl TV shows, but has also played a big role in bringing Marvel's sprawling Wastelanders podcast to life. The podcast has been a huge undertaking. Wastelanders features almost endless appearances from iconic Marvel characters, but is focused on Hawkeye, Black Widow, Star-Lord, Wolverine, and Doctor Doom. And the project, which first got underway in 2021, finally concluded this month. Thanks for talking with me today. Uh, Can you tell me a little bit uh, about your background in the industry going into Wastelanders and how you came aboard this project? Oh, man, my journey through the industry has been a little all over the map. Uh, I started off uh, out of grad school a billion years ago as a playwright, Uh, lived in New York and wrote plays. Uh, I made the switch out here in about 2012 to uh, move to LA and work in TV and film. Uh, And along the way, I wound up working uh, with Marvel, uh, working on Cloak and Dagger and Jessica Jones, uh, those TV shows. And through that process, you know, I've met the Marvel execs, uh, and one of them, Ellie Pyle, uh, who's a a good friend and a great supporter, approached me uh, about uh, jumping on board uh, the Hawkeye podcast uh, that came out, the first sort of round of Wastelanders. And uh, that was how I got into it. It was the first podcast I'd ever written, uh, and I had a blast. I don't know whether scripted drama is the first thing people think about when it comes to podcasts. Um, but it, it was such a dominant form on the radio in the 1930s, 1940s. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you find yourself uh, personally inspired by that kind of classic storytelling? Definitely. And I leaned a lot on theater storytelling because, you know, so much of theater is in the dialogue and is in conversation. Uh, it's definitely a different format. And it's true. It isn't the first thing. It's not the first thing I think of when I think of podcasts, though there's obviously a very large community uh, and sort of growing market of scripted podcasts and and narrative podcasts. Um, But yeah, for me, it was mostly leaning back on my theater chops and on uh, getting people into rooms to talk uh, and then wrapping my brain around the the radio show aspect of uh, a narrative podcast or a scripted podcast uh, in that like, there's a lot more you have to describe to the audience. You have to figure out how to make it okay for people to narrate what they're doing. Paramedics out cold. I'll go you one worse. Your patient's dead. Damn it. That's all you gotta say? This is your fault! Hey, pal. If I hadn't a stepped in, you'd be- I know be... who you are. You're Wolverine. I mean, Wastelanders is, is a huge six-season podcast. Um, it's been going since June 2021, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, was that story all planned out from the beginning, or has it evolved as you've Uh, you've gone along there it's definitely evolved Um, when we started working the writers were a bit siloed we had a couple of sort of writers summits uh to agree on some basics and you know ellie uh uh as the executive producer and sort of head editor uh on the scripted side of it um did a lot of keeping everything sort of in line and, and balancing us out. Uh, I was given, when I built Hawkeye, Old Man Hawkeye, I was given a fair amount of latitude. And there's a fair amount that like the world allows because it's divided into these sections and each section can be very different from the other. So uh, given the kingdom, uh, I was able to um, build a lot of that world myself. Uh, And then once we moved into the Wastelanders and to sort of the team up part of it, then we were all pulled together and it became a a much more sort of uh, traditional, at least for a writer, TV writer, uh, group collective effort. Did you feel there was an opportunity here to explore these characters and their relationships in a way that they haven't been before, given it is such a huge canvas here? Yes, yes. There was a great way uh, to dig into surprising connections and weird connections um, and also to really, really lean on the comic book history uh, Mm. in a way that, uh, to be honest, you know, as much as I love working in sort of comic book TV, that universe is so separate from the comic book universe. 
Uh, but this was allowed to be just because of the nature of Old Man Logan, you are allowed to maintain that sort of shared history, those shared reference points of the sort of traditional classic uh, Marvel characters and their mar that Marvel world, that 616 world, while taking huge leaps. Uh, and for me, it was also a lot of trying to imagine, uh, kind of locking on my, my sci-fi helmet and trying to imagine what that world would look like left to run rampant in its evolution over, you know, 50 years uh, and how that would develop. Um, but it was always going back to, okay, what's in some ways, what's canon uh, and just being very conscious about where we were going to break canon and uh, where we needed to break canon uh, and where we weren't. Can you give me some examples of where you felt you needed to break canon with the characters? Uh, some of it was in connecting characters that weren't really connected before, um, in, in giving them a, a shared history or a shared background. Uh, in Hawkeye, you know, a lot of it takes place at this circus. Yes. And, you know, the Ringmaster and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants never really worked together. They didn't really have that shared history. But building that as like, well, they would. You know, they they could. Um, and so building those connections and those sort of ideas uh, were, was what we were allowed to do. And, and as we got them together, build working, working with that, building on those shared histories and that shared idea of these people knew each other outside of it. Right. Uh, this has a uh, wasteland this has such a huge voice cast um yeah what are the logistics of bringing in so many like phenomenal actors to play these iconic roles and how does that work because every every episode you listen to there are the, you hear the credits at the end and it's just reeling off these absolute Funny. stars you know and they they've done such a great job so yeah what are the logistics of, <laughs> of getting that many people on board I mean in some ways we got lucky because we started during the lockdown. And so people were home and they didn't right. have anything else to do. Uh, and so I think we were able to get some people who might not have been available. But the other thing that we also have is the Marvel name. Everyone wants to be a part of the Marvel universe to work on Marvel projects, to play these characters. And I think that uh, attracts a lot of people across all of the spectrums. There's a lot of secret geeks out there uh, and it's, I mean, thankfully, as the writer, I didn't have to manage those schedules and figure out how to get all of those people. Um, and thankfully, for most of it, we didn't have to get them in the same room. Uh, and so there was a lot of juggling the schedule of, oh, this person is in Ireland. So we have to figure out a time that works for them and well as someone who's in California. Um, but thankfully, they could be in their own private little closets doing it, uh, as opposed to trying to get them into one studio. Um, but but it was a it's a like Herculean task and like blessings upon Ellie and uh, her producing partner Jenny uh, Madlet Rast and uh, the the uh, the audio producers One Thousand Birds. Like they were able to make it happen and pull it all together, and that it's a, a beautiful, beautiful group effort. What have been your personal favorite uh, voice performances in the series so far? And and was there anyone that you thought, oh, of course, they may make a perfect version of I that? I mean, um, God, names are uh, the names are completely escaping me. I can see his face. Chris <laughs> Elliott uh, as Rocket. Yeah, brilliant, 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 brilliant. I mean, obviously, I am uh, biased towards Lang, slang, uh, Stephen Lang as oh. Hawkeye. He was just the perfect voice and the perfect person to inhabit that role. Now focus all that hurt and anger and hate and pain into the point of the arrow. Focus it all the way down and shoot me. Uh, Susan Sarandon as Widow is, is great. And I also, because I'm a, a former New York theater people, I had a bunch of like theater friends uh, and old friends in it. Jim Conroy played Blob in uh, Wastelanders and we went to college together and actually haven't seen each other or been able to work together in a really long time. So that was a, a real thrill. Uh, and another great actor I know from LA, Ramiz Monsef, uh played Magneto and is just one of my favorite humans. So it was just, like it was really just a a, a, a surfeit of riches uh, to use a, yet another fancy word. So is there anyone specifically that in your mind, they are that character now, just having listened to 
so much of them playing them like has there anyone been that iconic to you so I don't want to make you play favorites <laughs> it's not played favorites it's honestly just named Michelle Hurd uh is now will always be my Bobby like that's that's just she's so wonderful and gave such a great performance that she's it's locked in forever I can't I can barely imagine the character any other way <laughs> Um, as this uh, Wastelanders is audio only, like you can't incorporate the visuals usually associated with comics, with mm-hmm. TV or movies. Um, so what have the challenges of making a Marvel podcast been? Oh, man. I mean, figuring out the action uh, and figuring out the, the producers were really, really excellent uh, with uh, helping me remember that certain sounds might seem distinctive, like the, like pulling an arrow. <laughs> back in a bow might feel like that's a distinctive sound. It is not. Um, <laughs> shuffling cards is not a distinctive sound. So uh, it's, it became a lot of, okay, what distinct, what is a distinctive sound? How can I also incorporate uh, describing what's happening into the dialogue and how in some ways, yeah, to, to limit that action and let still let the audience's imagination go through. You don't have to narrate every single punch but you do also have to be able to communicate the physicality of a scene to the actors because they're still going to add it add their grunts and their, their oof. So they have to know a little bit about what's happening. Um, But mostly it's really just leaning back on uh, as much as possible, getting people, getting characters into a room so they can talk uh, and letting the imagination fill in the scope, especially with the big action sequences, you know, and also when we, uh, in Wastelanders, when we cross into Marvel World, uh, it was a lot of, or Marvel City, it was a lot of communicating to the producers what that sound, how that sounds differently uh, than the regular world. Were there other Wastelanders versions of characters that you would like to have included here, but weren't able to uh, fit in? There were a few. There was, uh, although we did use Magneto, I had written... Uh, a scene uh, that did not make the cut because it didn't actually work in the story of uh, Magneto talking to his cat, Charles. Uh, and I had this like desert person living in exile. And I, I liked that. Um, we got to use so many characters and so much of the world that, uh, and characters that I, I never even sort of imagined we would get to use. So that was I, I felt like, I, at least for me, I know I got to use uh, it, almost any character I wanted to in in many ways, especially once we got into Marvel City uh, and I was able to write for like the Fantastic Four, which was just a thrill. Um, when you talk about Mag- Magneto sort of talking to his cat, it always reminds me of how great Magneto is when he's just left to his own devices. Yes. I'm thinking about like original Secret Wars Magneto sort of roaming uh, around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sort of touching things, putting things in his mouth. Just no idea what he's up to. He, when he gets bored, he gets very creative. So. He does. And he's such an emo character. I feel like we kind of forget how sort yeah. of emotional and um, and in good ways passionate and, and like also just impressive. He's... You know, if he were in high school, he would have dyed black hair and it would hang in his face and he'd be walking around saying, you just don't understand me. (laughs) That's true. Um, Is there another Marvel character or team that you'd like to write for or direct? Oh, definitely not direct. I have no interest in ever directing anything ever at all. That is way too much work. I am far too lazy. Um, Writing for, I mean, right now I'm writing a comic for Bishop and that's really exciting. I would love to take, I love the X-Men. I love the New Mutants. I would love to take a crack at the New Mutants. Uh, Would be a lot of fun. Um, I've written a little Peter Parker Spider-Man for Marvel Unlimited um, and would, would certainly love to do more. Um, and I miss the champions. Like I like I get, like the New Mutants. I like a good teen group. There's just something about the like soapy teen drama and the optimism and hope uh, in young characters that I, I really like writing for. So I don't know how many how much we can talk about in terms of the, well this is supposed to uh, conclude very imminently um, mm-hmm. Wastelanders. Yep. Um, I don't know how much of the sort of finale episodes we're allowed to discuss here, um, but I I would love to know um, what what you imagine the story being of, of these people, um, you know, finally getting together at the mm-hmm. end. 
And instead of sort of the a, a final climax in a movie, which maybe everyone gets together and there's sort of 25 minutes of action, yeah. you've got 10 episodes of a team up here. So yes. everything's happening as a very a slow burn almost. Yes. Uh, so how do you go about writing a slow burn team, team up? I mean, the good thing is that we had so many threads to pull together. Uh, and I got to work really closely with Mark Wade, which is a dream come true, and, and Nick Bernadone uh, on sort of building this out and like figuring out how to, the trickiest thing here is, you know, we had all of these series that had their own emotional arcs and their own stories. And then we had to find a way to knit them all together. And I think that helps with the slow burn so that there's a, a point of the po coming together and then they're together and then there's a big climax. And there is a lot of action uh, and it's very thrilling and a lot of very surprising things happen. But what be, what the, the format also allows is there's a lot of uh, like, long deep talks as well as these really these these five broken people who have lived through an apocalypse and the aftermath and have done terrible things and had terrible things happen to them and have lost everything they cared about uh have to reckon with that and reckon ultimately with how do you build a better world and it, not to make it all sound very uh, uh, ironically nerdy and like Fru fru, but it is all it really is a conversation about how do you rebuild the world? You know, what's what are you trying to build the world that was before, or are you trying to build something new? Uh, and for me personally, that's always an, an interesting conversation and an interesting discussion. Uh, and to do it with these characters, I think, makes it extra exciting. I think um, you're able to take advantage of that, especially as you've gone as you've gone along. There's been more and more opportunity to have those yeah. moments where characters, as you say, are in a room and magic is happening. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking as as well about the one episode of uh, Wastelanders Doom, where mm -hmm. they are getting Doom drunk. <laughs> and who hasn't <laughs> always wanted to see that? Right, and who, and I just thought that was a very magical episode yeah. <laughs> yes. So yes everyone's on top form and just you, you're like what is going to happen here <laughs> yes I mean that's the beauty of this the beauty of having these actors and having these performers like you really just let them go and let them do their thing uh and just try to get out of their way and give them just give them stuff to play with it's it's great it's mad it is magic literal magic yeah so you said you're writing a Bishop comic for Marvel yep. right now. What is next for you or what is in the future for you uh, at Marvel or beyond? Uh, I mean, at Marvel, I've got the Bishop uh, book coming out. The first issue drops February 8th. Uh, a new, I've been writing a, a fair amount for Spider-Verse Unlimited on the Marvel Unlimited app and uh, a new arc uh, featuring Ghost Spider, Spider-Gwen uh, has just started dropping. So you'll get that. And then I've got a couple more uh, Marvel Universe things that I can't talk too much about on their way, but keep an eye out for some really, really fun stuff. Uh, and outside of that, uh, I just started, we just started the writer's room for the sixth season of The Handmaid's Tale, um, which I've been working on for the last year or so, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. Okay. Is that the last season of The Handmaid's Tale? It will, sixth and final season. Ah, uh, yes. Um, is there oh, anything yeah. that you can tell us about that? I don't actually Literally have nothing. Okay. <laughs> Literally nothing. I mean, partly because, you know, all of the reasons, but also because today will be like day two of the writer's room. So there is nothing to talk about. There's nothing to tell. Okay. Um, this is just uh, one for me, really. Um, yeah. Who reads the credits at the end of every episode of Wasteland? Ooh, that um, is actually a good question that I don't think I know. At the beginning, I feel like he said Tim Rose or Tim Rhodes. Probably Tim Rhodes sounds and familiar. I tried looking Tim Rose and Tim Rhodes up, but I couldn't find someone with the credit. And th uh, this has weirdly been one of my favorite parts of Wastelanders. Oh. Because it would be easy to skip through those credits, right? Yes. But I find myself really involved in the dramatic reading <laughs> and the way it seems to get more dramatic as the series goes on uh, really tickles me. So I always listen to them all the way to the end. And I was just, I was fascinated by um, whether you knew who that was because I couldn't find the credit anywhere. Marvel Entertainment and Series XM present Marvel's Wastelanders, starring Dylan Baker as Dr. Doom. Timothy Busfield as Star-Lord, Stephen Lang as Hawkeye, Robert Patrick as Wolverine, and Susan Sarandon as Black Widow. I do not, but you know what? I can find out.
I know the people who know. (laughs) Yes, please find out for me. Thank you. Will do. Yeah, thank you so much for talking with me. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Marvel's Wastelanders is available wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you all for watching, listening to Marvel Standom. As always, please consider subscribing anywhere and everywhere. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Twitch, you know the drill. Uh, Don't forget to check out our web home of denofgeek.com where you can find all our Marvel coverage. Drop us a line and let us know your burning questions and what you want us to cover this year. We're Marvel Standom on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks to Andrew Halley, the best producer in any corner of the multiverse. He puts up with a lot from us, as you may know. And of course, a special shout out to Michael R for making the podcast version of this show all it can be. This has been Marvel Standom on the Den of Geek Network. Until next time, please be good to each other and stay safe.